In the 1970s, bioregionalism was a big deal. Its popularity was seen in E.F. Schumacher's breakthrough book, Small is Beautiful, and the wildly popular Whole Earth Catalog. There was the deep ecology movement and numerous efforts to relocalize markets and intensify local agriculture. In the 70s, some people in the Pacific Northwest even went so far as to rename their region Cascadia and imagine new ways to protect it. Then the hammer of neoliberalism came down in the early 1980s. Ronald Reagan and Margaret Thatcher assumed power in the U.S. and U.K. in an era of fierce economic growth was unleashed by deregulation, rapacious trade treaties, and the celebration of so-called free markets and libertarian individualism, combined, ironically enough, with generous subsidies of corporations while austerity politics was imposed on the rest of us. Bioregionalism as an idea was essentially banished for the next 40 years. Recently, however, bioregionalism has burst back into the popular imagination. This time, it's being propelled by the urgency of climate change and global supply chain disruptions brought on by the pandemic. People are also waking up to the horrendous history of capitalism, especially through colonialism. People are starting to realize that free market development over the century has entailed imperial seizures of land, oil, minerals, and also genocides of indigenous and traditional peoples and the racial othering of people who aren't trying to become modern or develop. Land lies at the center of this discussion. In so many places around the world, land has been stolen. Investors and settlers have used military force, government pressure, and legal trickery to claim private ownership in land, which is then exploited for market production. Land that historically has been stewarded as commons became corporate assets. It was repurposed to generate as much money as profitable through palm oil plantations and genetically modified crops and monocrop agriculture and the clear cutting of forests. This is happening today. Land is acquired as capital to serve the West's vision of global development and resource extraction becomes the priority to serve markets with little care or uh, for the local needs or the ecological consequences. The bioregional movement is about recovering and restoring land. It's about letting trees, rivers, forests, plant life, wildlife reassert their natural rhythms. It's about acknowledging the needs and imperatives of nature itself, apart from the economic uses imposed on it. Nature has its own agency, its own needs beyond those of humans, after all. Bioregionalism is about honoring this existential reality. It's about creating durable, innovative ways for people to care about the places where they live and to help people steward that shared wealth of landscapes in thoughtful, conscientious ways. Fortunately, there's a wide variety of movements trying to build new, more sustainable types of economies with bioregional mindsets. Some are explicitly focused on removing land from speculative markets so that ecosystems can become healthy again. Community land trusts are one important way to do this, but also a way to escape the pathologies of industrial agriculture. By taking land off the market and lowering land expenses for farmers, food can be grown organically and responsibly for local markets. That approach is used by groups like Agrarian Trust in the U.S. and Terre de Lien in France. Community-supported agriculture farming uses a similar strategy to lower costs and risks. Households are invited to purchase upfront shares in the harvest, and local households uh, enter into partnerships with farmers, helping to reduce their exposure to volatile supply chains and high prices. Agricultural co-ops are another strategy. Farmers and consumers can aggregate their market power and build bioregionally sensitive food systems. Agroecology and permaculture are valuable ways to build food sovereignty in a region. Bioregionalism also needs community forests, conservation trusts, urban agriculture, and community gardens. In the Global South, the Kamu Alidad movement is decolonize people's attitudes towards land. Its members regard the idea of private property and 
capital-driven markets is a profound ethical and ecological violation. What's needed is a sacred respect for nature and cultures of collective stewardship in the spirit of indigenous peoples. There are other forces contributing to the bioregional ethic. Movements to win rights of legal personhood for nature or the rights of nature are expanding. This is an attempt to let rivers, mountains, land, and other natural systems be represented in court. Other activist movements are pushing for laws and treaties to make ecocide a crime. The goal is often to stop huge infrastructure projects like dams, highways, and mines that cause irreversible harm to ecosystems. The global movement to protect bioregions got a huge boost in 2022 with the launch of the Regenerative Bioregion Summit, which convened many disparate movements and explored how they could support each other. You could say that we're now seeing a renaissance of bioregional thinking through such projects as the Earth Regenerators Fund in Barichara, Colombia, which is building a living laboratory of regeneration for a degraded tropical forest in the northern Andes. And there are proliferating efforts to take this work global in other sorts of bioregions through education, organizing, and bioregional funding. Projects such as the Design School for Regenerating Earth, Eco-Agriculture Partners, and Common Land. As the bioregional advocate Joe Brewer often says, Onward, humans. <laughs>